to your faith, your pathway home. This is Matthew Allen with Jim Gershon. Good morning, Matt. So good to be back and be with you. Uh, we we, uh, we missed you last week. Uh, my wife and I were in uh, Maine, and uh, we uh, worked with the church up there in Pittsfield, Maine, uh, in a gospel meeting and took a few days off. But it is always good to get home and get back to Ohio. And uh, it's especially good to be here with you this morning as we, we study together. Uh, your Pathway Home is a work of the Kettering Church of Christ. We meet at 4600 Bigger Road in Dayton. Uh, we are just minutes off of Interstate 675, not very hard to find at all. Uh, we'd love to have you join us today. 930 this morning we'll be, be meeting for a children's devotional. And then at 10 uh, or 945 we'll be meeting for Bible classes and then at 1045, we'll be meeting for worship this morning. Hope you can join us. Check us out on the web, KetteringChurch.com. You can find out all about who we are and what we do. Jim, good morning. Welcome. Well, good morning, Matt. It's been a, been a great week. We've had a lot of good Bible studies and, and opportunities to be with other Christians. And we're thankful for the opportunity we have this morning just to be with you and to share some time as we study God's Word. Matt, uh, we have a Friday morning Bible study we've been participating in. We're studying the book of Romans, uh, Friday morning about 6.30. Uh, we've been having that study for about 30 years or more. Yeah. Uh, but now we're in the book of Romans, and it's kind of interesting because while we study the book of Romans, we come up with a, a lot of interesting subjects. And, and uh, we, one, we really do. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, um, we were taking our time this time, just going through five to ten verses at a time, and really just kind of slowing down, looking at, at the, what Paul is teaching. Yeah, there's so much in the Bible. Obviously, it can't be exhausted because you, every time you open it, you, you read and you learn new things. And uh, there's, there's so many things that we study that sometimes we study looking at what other people believe instead of what the Bible says. And we need to be uh, looking at the Bible for what it says, not what has been taught by ourselves or by denominations or by other religions. We need to be looking at the Bible as God's Word and what God says about things. And, and I think that's a, taking it slow like that is a good opportunity for us to understand it. It, it really is. And we want to focus uh, briefly this morning as we lead off our discussion. And by the way, before we lead off the discussion, let me remind you, uh, our viewers, that uh, we, we, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. If you have a, a comment or a reaction or a question or whatever, um, we, we, want, we want to know uh, that you're there and that maybe you have something that you'd like to talk about, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that. So, so let us know. Uh, type in. I see a lot of you joining the broadcast right now, even as we speak. That's great. Um, but you are more than welcome to participate with us. Um, as as we study together this morning. Jim, I want to start by looking at Romans chapter 4 for just a second. And uh, this, this whole section is where Paul begins to uh, really present the idea of salvation by faith. Uh, this is something that to many of his readers, there was um, uh, a problem. Many of them were uh, coming out of Judaism, were still trying to cling to the Old Testament law, uh, and really try to cling to it desperately and incorporate the Old Testament law into Christianity. And so part of Paul's mission, as he is writing here, is to try to demonstrate that salvation did not come by adherence to the old law. And that, that is, that's one of the main contexts behind the book of Romans. And, and so most of the time when you read the book of Romans and you see references to law or the law, understand that it's pointing back to the Old Testament. Now, there are uh, higher principles there where some of these applications could be made to law in general, but most of the time when Paul is talking about law in Romans, he's simply talking about the Old Testament law and that it no longer uh, leads one to salvation. Yeah, and I think it's an important subject because when we think about law, law, uh, the, uh, law has to have an authority behind it. And God is the authority. But we are told by John that sin is transgression or going beyond missing the mark of the law. And that uh, the law establishes what is proper. So to do other than what is proper is disobedience. 
-hmm. And when you start the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 talks about uh, the, the condition of the world, people not wanting to retain God in their mind. So they want to do, with, uh, do away with authority. And in chapter 2, uh, in chapter 2 and 3, it talks about the Gentiles, all Gentiles being under sin, all Jews being under sin. In Romans 3, 23, we all sin yeah. and fall short of the glory of God. So this issue of law is important because people want to have the idea or the concept that law no longer exists. exists. Yeah. And that's just not true. God is the authority in our lives. And when God says something, that is what he expects us to live by. So the standard of law has never gone away. But as Matt referred to, Romans, they're, they're fighting uh, Judaizing teachers in the Lord's church that are going to tell these people to be a Christian, you're going to have to do the works of the law of yeah, Moses. You have to do circumcision, you have yeah. to offer sacrifices, all, all of those kind of things. So, that, so he's dealing with that. He, and he's dealing with that. So when we get to chapter 4, he, he's already said the Gentiles are sinners, the, the Jews are sinners, we all are sinners because we all fall short of the law. And so therefore... Now he begins to explain how we are saved. And, and, the, and the emphasis here, as you begin in, in verse 3, is he goes back to Abraham. Abraham is uh, referred to as the father of faith uh, by, by some of the New Testament writers. And, and notice what he says. He points in verse 3, Romans 4, 3, he points back to Genesis 15. And, and he, he says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then we get into verse 4, 5, and 6. And uh, I, I think sometimes uh, this is where things begin to go south, if you will, for some of our religious friends of the day who will interpret these verses as uh, the, what's said in verse 4, 5, and 6, basically saying all we've got to do is believe, and that's all we've got to do. There's nothing else. Um, once we believe, we're, we're good to go. And here, here's what it says. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who... Excuse me. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And I want to focus on that last part of verse 6. Because there are a lot of people who will take what is said. The end of verse 6, God counts righteousness apart from works. And then from there, make the application that I don't have to do anything. after just believe. And, and uh, I, I, I really, we want to stress this morning that if we just stop there, that we are missing the point of what Paul is trying to teach. Yeah, because in this passage, what, he, what he's talking about is the Jews are trying to require certain acts that they say make you righteous. And, and God is the one that makes the person righteous, and he does that through Jesus Christ, as we learn in chapter 3. It's a gift of God that is to be received through faith. Now, there's the word faith. Now, what people want to call faith is mental assent, or I agree with, but that's not what faith is. And... and and faith is not just this word that says, well, I believe something, so I can go about and do whatever I want. You know, faith is, is an action word. It not only means a system of belief, it not only means that I have confidence in it or trust in it, but the word has a whole lot more meaning to it than just say there's some kind of mental decision that we made that we are in agreement with. So what they'll do here is they'll say, well, works don't have anything to do with it. And the point of this chapter is Abraham couldn't be justified by all the works that he did. He was a man that fell under sin. And once we sin, there is no work that we can do, period, to bring us back into that relationship with God because we have violated the, our covenant and our relationship with God. So all of us fall into that sin, and none of us can undo that sin by anything that we do. Right. And, that, and that's where we're talking about the concept of, of work saving us. We can't do that. That's impossible. And, and with that, we would totally agree. Yeah. You know, uh, salvation is only by the power of God, and we, we must uh, submit and bend to the expectations that God gives us. And, uh, Jim, we, we talked briefly about this with a friend Thursday night uh, over, over dinner, uh, and, and he was talking about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 one gives us the classic definition of faith. 
uh, where uh, we read, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So that is probably the best definition of what faith is from the Bible, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And to go, to go along with that, um, let's just go back and dive into this for just a second and talk about how that word faith is defined there because it'll help us understand as we, we go back to our primary text in Romans 4 when we're talking about salvation by faith and what that actually means. But the sense of the word, when we talk about the defining of faith, it, it really means to have strong confidence in and reliance upon someone or something. Uh, and often with the idea of trust, okay, so faith involves trust. And, and then uh, here's something else that I, I think is, is really neat about this. Um, uh, uh, Thayer in his, in his writing uh, talks about trusting, uh, but then he goes on down through here and, and connects with that. There's the sense of it that there's obedience, right. okay? There's a following through with our faith. It's not just, as you mentioned a moment ago, the, the mental assent where I, I choose to agree or I make a, an internal mental decision that I believe. There, there's an actual, it, it implies a, a going forward, taking steps forward, and, and those taking those steps forward are not what saves me. God is the one that saves me, but it is a result of the decision that I make. Yeah, and, and you have to, to, to think that, that there's nothing that you have to do. You have to totally ignore so many passages. But let's just stay in Hebrews 11 and go to verse 6, where the same writer who just defined faith said, For without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and look at the second part of that. And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So the expectation is not only that you have this mental assent that there is a God, you are subject to him, he's the creator of all, and, and you believe in him, but that you diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. Then you go to verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that was to be received as an inheritance. Wait a minute. Abraham's faith led him to do what? To do something. To obey. obey. To obey. Yeah. So what happens is people want to take faith or belief and, and separate it from obedience. But in James chapter 4, James makes the point in, in verse 14. You say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your action. I'll show you faith by action. Yeah. See, faith is something that is coupled with not only our resolve to believe, but our resolve to act and to follow what God says. Now, it is God that does the salvation. It is God that gives the gift, Romans chapter 3, but that gift is received by faith. That's an action that we take, not only the ascent, but the action that we take to receive the gift that God has provided for us. You know, something that just came to mind uh, thinking about this, Jim, uh, we, we see in the Gospels Jesus teaching uh, time and time again about our fruit, right. okay? Uh, by your fruits, you will be known, right? And, and so as we, what is, uh, what is our fruit? If I don't have any fruit, then the question is, do I have any faith? Yeah. And, and, and obviously, if I have faith, then I'm going to have fruit, or I'm going to have actions that demonstrate that. And I, I, there's, you and I were talking before we went on the, on the air this morning about Paul's writing in Ephesians 2. And I, I want to take you over there and just, just for a moment. And, and th this, is, this is a great passage, and uh, a lot of times our, uh, our religious friends will quote Ephesians 2.8. And, and believe me, we believe Romans 2, or Ephesians 2.8. When, when Paul says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. That is an absolute fact. Uh, we, we believe that. Paul goes on to say, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Again, we totally believe that passage. We would not disagree with it. We believe that to be the biblical, Holy Spirit-inspired truth. Yes. Now, but there's more to it than this, okay? What is the result of that faith? that we have, the grace by which we've been saved. What has God done for us? Well, look at verse 10. 
And, and, and notice here what he says in verse 10, Ephesians 2. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what I want you to see when you read Ephesians 2.10, here immediately after what Paul has said in Ephesians 2.8 and 9, uh, we see the active faith that is actively trusting God day by day by day. And, and here's something that's really cool. Um, that, that word there in uh, verse 10, it says, we are God's workmanship. Um, that word, if you go back into the original language, this, this is just, to me, the coolest thing. Um, the, the, the idea here is that we are God's creation. In fact, the New Revised Standard Version says, we are what he has made us. And uh, in other words, we are God's masterpiece, as the New Living Translation says. We are God's handiwork, uh, according to the New American Bible, and we are God's work of art. God did that. God did that for us, okay? Um, and and I, th I think that's really cool to think of it from that perspective. Um, uh, you know, if you imagine each one of us are God's own individual painting that he has created to display his glory. And he's the one doing that. I, I don't do it. I simply surrender and allow him to work through me. And I do that through my adherence to the word of God. Yeah. And, and then notice also here in Ephesians 2.10, the word created. This, this, is, this, is, uh, this is powerful because it's, it's written uh, in, a, in a casual sense. He's the one that did this. We don't do it. He does it, all right? Um, uh, it's done to us. We are his workmanship. And, and it's the same word that was used back in the beginning to talk about creation itself, all of that being done by God. But then he says created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. And what, what are those? Works are the outgrowth of God's work in our heart. And, and so uh, th these are powerful passages, okay? So I, when, we, when we look at this and we hear the idea, well, I, I've believed and that's all I've got to do. I'm good um, uh, and, and I, can, I can live however I want to live because I, I believe I'm going to be fine. I'm saved by grace. Not according to these passages, okay? Yeah. Uh, there, there's, a, there's something that happens. There's a transformation that happens. And, and after that transformation takes place, everybody <laughs> can see it because I have, uh, God's going to work in my life. I'm changing the way that I'm living. I'm changing my attitudes. I'm changing my perspectives. I, I, I've become a new person. Yeah, I, and, and, I, and I love Ephesians too because when you get to talking with certain people, They'll want to give you verse 5, for by grace you have been saved. And they want to stop right there and not define anything. But when you take it to verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You need to understand something. God's grace does not work separate from faith. God's grace is put into place by faith. Yeah. So, so grace doesn't save you separate and apart from faith. And we are his workmanship created in good work. Uh, uh, created through Jesus Christ unto good works that we are, uh, he ordained that we should walk in them. But here's an important thing to think about. When we think about this concept, is God has designed what is righteousness and what is good. When you look at all the other biblical writers, you get to 2 Peter chapter 1, and Peter says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And then he gives a list of things to add to over in Galatians, he talks us, uh, the Apostle Paul talks to us about walking in the Spirit. In Philippians, he tells us how to think, Philippians 4, verse 8. So constantly we're being refined by how God wants us to live and how God wants us to think. So there's actions on our part that says we believe in God, therefore we will do. Paul even said it in 2 Corinthians when he said the love of Christ constrains me. I've judged this, one died for me, what's the result of that? I'm going to die for him. Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, but it's Christ living in me. Yeah. There's an action that Paul is taking by his faith. So the importance of understanding this, 
is most of these arguments, and I think this is kind of interesting, most of these arguments come about with the concept of doing away with the idea of baptism. And, and, and yeah. what they want to do is say, well, that, that you're doing something. You think you're earning your salvation through baptism. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great transition point, Tim. I'm glad you went there because I was, I was wanting to go there. And, and um, uh, we, we, we hear this a lot, okay? And, and there's, there's really, okay, there's, there's, there's two sides of this. You have, and this is, this is what I think is um, uh, we have to be careful about when we, when we deal in, delve into religious matters. We can, we can run to one extreme or the other. I think on one extreme you have the people that say, well, uh, baptism is totally unnecessary. Uh, you don't have to have it. All you have to do is believe. And then you can go way, 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 way on the other side of this and just emphasize baptism to the point where we've got to dunk you in water. There's no consideration given whatsoever to what that means and the commitment that's involved in it. It's just all about getting more people uh, in, in the water. Yeah. And so we've got, we've, got to, we've got to kind of back away from either one of those extremes and look at what the Bible actually says. And before Jim and I dive into that, I, I know we have a number of people watching this morning. We want to thank you for, for doing that. And we want to invite you to, to participate with us this morning and, and let us know what you're thinking. Uh, what, what are your thoughts when it comes to faith and works? And what are your thoughts when it comes to uh, the necessity of baptism um, and, and, and really matters of salvation? What, what, do, what do you think about uh, the, these types of things? We, we want to hear from you this morning. Or if you have another topic or something you want us to talk about, Jim and I will, will, will gladly pivot to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, try, to, try to answer your question. But we, we appreciate you uh, being with us this morning. So um, I, well, I want to I look here at, um, uh, we, go, we go through this chapter in Romans 4, and, and uh, Paul references back to Abraham's circumcision. Right. And did you know that there are many New Testament passages that uh, kind of connect uh, circumcision with the with uh, baptism, the act of baptism. Colossians chapter two, I think, is is one of the the the, the most effective passages that that deal with this. And I, if you if you look down here at what Paul is is talking about in verse eleven, all right. Whereas in the Old Testament times, circumcision was a physical thing that men were subjected to in order to have a sign of the covenant. All right, you take all of the physical things and you see that there, what was going on. Yet in the New Testament, what we see the teaching of is that baptism is the uh, spiritual action that identifies us with God. It is the sign of the covenant that we are making with God. It is a sign of the trust that we are exhibiting in God. Okay, So, for example, here's Colossians 2.11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, okay? So who's doing the work? God is, all right? By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So think about how what Paul says there in 2.11, Colossians 2.11, ties in with what he writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 4. Where we're, in baptism, we are putting to death the old body of sin, all right? That's the same uh, imagery used here. We're, we're putting off the body of the flesh in baptism. We're making a distinction between the old and the new. This is the line of demarcation. When I go down into the water, I'm, I, my old person is, is being done away with, and I am going to come out of that water a new creation. And notice what Paul says in verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, this is Colossians 2.12, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So what is Paul saying there in verse 12 of Colossians 2? Well, baptism is a burial, all right? It's an immersion in water, and it is similar to what uh, happened with Jesus' death. Jesus was buried in the ground, and then 36 hours later, on the third day, he arises up out of that and is raised into, into new life, and he's done by the powerful working of God. 
And Paul says here, and Paul says in Romans 6, that that's what happens in our baptism. By the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power is being used to raise us from spiritual death and into life with Christ. God does that, and it's, it is, it's an action that is absolutely necessary for salvation. You know, Skip uh, writes in every week, and we, we really appreciate his comments, but he said he, he had seen a debate where a Baptist preacher was, was talking about what it is. Well, let's go back to, uh, to the concept of what the Bible says here, but to, when you talk about a Baptist pe- preacher, some of them think that John Calvin is a very instrumental in Baptist faith. I got, a, I got a quote here from John Calvin uh, from the Institute, Book 4, Chapter 13. And here's what John Calvin says. For he commands all who believe to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Therefore, those who have imagined that baptism is nothing more than a mark or sign by which we profess our religion before men, as soldiers wear an insignia or a sovereign as a mark of their profession. They have not considered that that which was the principal thing in baptism, which is that we ought to receive it with this promise. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. John Calvin <laughs> believed in baptism. Yeah. Uh, where where they, they take, and Calvin had many things that, that he was off on. Um, but, but John Calvin was a believer in baptism for the remission of sins, for salvation. He didn't think it was a work. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the problem is we don't, we don't understand that faith ha- takes action, as the Hebrews 11 passage says. It's not something that's dead or dormant. It's something that responds to God with the heart that we have, that we judge that God's done this for us. Therefore, we die for him and we become his servants. We are changed. We become different. We follow in his workmanship, as Ephesians chapter 2 says. So it's, 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 it's something that people need to understand. And let's go back to the Colossians passage, Jim. Uh, in, in verse 13, Colossians 2, uh, You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. All right? So this is what happens. Uh, in the action of baptism. This is the moment uh, when the Spirit comes in and raises us from the dead and makes us alive again and cast away sin. You know, there's, there's something else that's interesting. I'm throwing out a lot of scriptures this morning. I understand that. Uh, 1 Corinthians six eleven talks about, uh, that's just after Paul goes through a whole laundry list of sin. He lists out that those who practice those sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, uh, such were some of you. And, and, and we, we, we usually stop right there, and we don't look at the next sentence. The second sentence of 1 Corinthians six eleven is absolutely powerful because it tells us what happens in our salvation. And uh, he, he, he says there in that passage, you were washed. What is that? The washing, as we've just been reading in Romans 6 and Colossians 2, the washing is our baptism. That's the action of the Spirit. When we, when we uh, submit to God in baptism, the Spirit takes away our sins. We were washed. We were sanctified. We were set apart. We were put into God's kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says that we were transferred in the kingdom of his beloved son, and then it says we were justified. We were declared not guilty. God's the only one that can do those things. And if you go back to the Colossians passage now that we were looking at, Colossians 2.13, uh, uh, we've been forgiven of our trespasses, and what, how did that, what, what was involved in that? The record of debt or sin that stood against us with all its legal demands, God set that aside. Jesus did by nailing it to the cross. And by doing that, he took away Satan's hold on our life and triumphed over them, he says in verse 15. You know, when, when Jim, when we, when we really get that and, and understand that, how could we not want to respond with an obedient, faithful life? Yeah. I think there's so many people that get caught up in, 
and uh, there, there's no change. I, the only change in their mind is, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that's on their lips. And they'll go to Romans 10, and they'll say, if you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord, uh, you know, it, they, they have to take it in context of the other things that are said in Romans. Christians need to confess Jesus every day with their mouth and in the way that they live. But we're told in Romans that we learn our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is an action that takes place when we receive God's word and we act upon God's word. It's not something that's dormant or dead as people, well, it's just a mental, you, you can't do anything to be saved. Well, I'll just tell you this. You can do everything to be lost because if you listen to God and do absolutely nothing, that's what will happen to you. That's the response. You must receive the gift, yeah. and that gift comes through faith in Jesus Christ, and that faith is a movement to become what God wants you to become. So we work on that daily. That doesn't save us. God saves us, but you can't be saved without pursuing, or as Paul says, diligently seeking him yeah. in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And that's why you read what you do in Colossians 3. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then the admonition from there through most of the rest of the chapter of Colossians 3 is what that involves. It involves putting sin to death. He talks about that beginning in verse 5. He talks about dealing with uh, external sins uh, that involve our, our body. Then he talks about internal sins. It involves sins of attitude and sins of the mind, anger and uh, the w words that we speak and, and those kind of things. And he talks about living in this new way, verse 10, putting on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. And, and then he goes on and talks about what the, what the spirit-filled life looks like, uh, hearts of compassion and meekness and patience, uh, hearts where we bear with one another and forgive one another. Uh, hearts that are full of love and care and concern. Uh, and all of this driven by this incredible sense of thankfulness. Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks for what? Thanks for making us who he wants us to be. Yeah, and that, that's the Christian life in a, in a nutshell. Uh, I know sometimes we get hung up on the theology. We look at passages and we say, look, I, I don't have to do anything. I, I'm good. I, I, I believed. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fine. Um, and, and, and I want to I wanna, I wanna suggest if, if we find ourselves making those kind of statements, we, are, we, we need to do some careful self-examination because everything in the New Testament implies an outgrowth of faith. A response in faith. And let me just throw out this one last passage, Jim, before we go. And at some point in our Roman study, um, I had, I had uh, highlighted Romans 4.12. And where Abraham is the father not only of the circumcised or the Jews who live by faith, but also uh, everyone who walks in the footsteps of faith. Um, that, friends and brethren, is an act of faith. That's what we're talking about, walking in the footsteps of faith, uh, walking in a relationship with God. That is what is so important. Thanks, Matt. Well, <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> It's so good to have all of you here, uh, for all of you who have tuned in from around the country, and uh, we've seen some of our Colombian brothers uh, uh, sign in this morning, and so good to see our brothers in South America. We appreciate you and love you, and uh, we love all of you, and thank you all for being a part of the program. Um, we will be meeting here this morning, 930, 945, and 1045 at the Kettering Church, 4600 Bigger Road, southeast side of Dayton, uh, just minutes off of 675, exit 7. Um, you can call us, uh, get information from us, check us out on the web. We'd love to talk to you because we want you to go to heaven. That's what it's all about, is getting home to heaven. 
That's why we do this broadcast every week called Your Pathway Home. We're looking for ways to help encourage you on your journey to heaven. That's Absolutely. why we're here. That's right. Well, until this time next week, we pray that God will bless you in your life. Don't forget about us. Tune in again next Sunday, same time, same location. Until then, may God bless you.